Welcome to Climate One, a conversation about America's energy, economy, and environment. I'm Greg Dalton. Today we're talking about the U.S. economy and auto industry with General Motors Chairman and CEO Dan Ackerson. Three years after the Obama administration bailed out the humble giant, a leaner General Motors is firing on all cylinders and recently posted its most profitable year ever. The new GM has paid back about half of the $50 billion it received from U.S. taxpayers, but the government's remaining 30% stake in the company could be seen as a financial and political liability. Over the next hour, we'll discuss this American comeback story, as well as gas prices, fuel economy, and the move toward electric cars, such as the Chevy Volt. Along the way, we'll include questions for Dan Ackerson from our live audience here at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco. Before taking the reins at GM in 2010, Mr. Ackerson was head of global buyout at the Carlyle Group, a private equity firm in Washington, D.C. He previously was CEO of General Instrument, where he succeeded Donald Rumsfeld, and prior to that, he served as CEO of Nextel. Please join me in welcoming GM's chief, Dan Ackerson, to Climate One. Dan, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So GM's just had a good year. Where is it now, and where are you trying to take the company in the years ahead? Well, actually, we had the best year we've ever had in 103-year history. We posted record profits. I hope that's not the last applause I get. <laughs> Depends um, on profits next year. Yeah. yeah, you're only as good as last <laughs> quarter. Um, where are we today? Um, you know, um, I'd been CEO of a couple of companies, as you mentioned, and being in private equity actually helped uh, coming into this industry. Uh, first, I was criticized for not being a car guy, and uh, that's okay. There are three non-car guys in uh, Detroit today, and it's, I think it's the first time in 20-odd years since all three of us, all three of the major American manufacturers are profitable. Uh, <laughs> We, we had to go through some difficult times, and um, there's been a lot of political dialogue on that, fro, to and fro, anti and pro. But um, where we are, we are, uh, after two-year hiatus, General Motors is, again, the largest auto manufacturer in the world. As I said, we had our most profitable year. Between 10 and 11 alone, we grew our revenue $15 billion. That alone would put us in a fortune 250. So um, our revenue today is about $150 billion, which would be larger than the gross national product of 100 countries in the, in the world. So it is a huge, I think, it's an American company. It's a global country, uh, company in the sense that we compete in 117 odd countries. Uh, we export um, around the globe. We're very successful in most of the high growth markets. We have the largest market share of any manufacturer in the world, auto manufacturer. Um, I think the lessons learned is we can't be as internally focused as we were before. And I mean by that, we had internal metrics. Are we better than the last model we made? Or are we looking at the aspiration old competition and saying, where do we think they'll be in three to five years? Is, um, Wayne Gretzky said he doesn't skate to where the puck is, he thinks he skates to where it's going to be. We would often say, well, we have a car and it's going to beat X, Y, Z. And, and, and the obvious question is, yeah, but by the time we get to market, are they going to still be static and they won't be? Uh, so we're much more external. We benchmark against the best in the industry. And, um, and we're producing great cars. Um, you see it um, when I think about what are the things that keep me awake at night. Um, first of all, we can't rest on our laurels. It would be very easy to say, the great year. Uh, the first thing we did and we announced is we've really got to attack our cost structure and make sure that we're viable and we're producing cash and we're going to be competitive. Our margins are not what our primary competition is. And over time you say, well, you're still making a lot of money. Well, if the other guy's more efficient than you are over a long time, companies don't fail in a year or two. It takes 10 years, 20 years, 30 years for the deterioration and the rot to really impact the viability of the company. So we can't be sitting here in 2030, 2035 and saying, well, what happened? The decisions that were made in 2012 are dispositive to the future of the, um, to future of the company. So we're in pretty good shape, but we have a lot of work to do. And um, 
we still have many issues that need to be addressed and resolved. We'll get to fuels and energy and climate change and some other things in, the, uh, in a little bit. But first, uh, the bailout has become quite a national political issue in this election season. You came from a private equity firm. Um, what do you think about the, was there private capital available that could have bailed out the company instead of taxpayers? Uh, did the deal give the UAW um, a deal over bondholders? Do you have any critiques of the, the bailout package? Well, I don't want to be defensive because uh, having come from private equity, we uh, experienced, were part of many restructurings, and there are multiple options, multiple avenues to a successful restructuring. And I know we have become somewhat of a um, punching bag in this political season. Uh, I don't want to get into the political arena, but I'll say this much. Uh, if you were in private equity, and we had a $100 billion portfolio around the globe, um, front row seat, it was coming off the wheels. And as Americans, we ought to be very, very proud. Our government stood up, regardless of party affiliation, and just like blood is critical to the body, liquidity is critical to the economy. And yes, we liquidated, net liquidated, we provided liquidity into the markets. And I was, I'm also the senior director at American Express, which is one of the larger financial institutions. Questions were, was, were they going to be viable? And um, it was a different set of circumstances in the financial uh, arena than it was in the manufacturing, specifically uh, in the automotive. But at the end of the day, regardless I, I don't want to debate it. I, I wouldn't have joined the board and I wouldn't join the company if I didn't agree with it because I think pragma pragmatism has to enter into the uh, economic dialogue. I went to graduate school uh, to London School of Economics. and Everybody knows that, but it's actually the London School of Economics and political science because you can't separate pol politics and economics on a macroeconomic scale. Did this company, in my, in my opinion, uh, and George Bush, and, and by the way, this two presidents of divergent political perspectives put money into this company. It wasn't just one of them. And, and they weren't running for office at the time. They were in the arena. They had to face the hard facts. And in my opinion, they made the pragmatic decision to save this company because it's now been estimated a million jobs were at risk. That's a million households. And on a personal level, this is a wealthy state and a wealthy community, and you all look very prosperous and wealthy to me. <laughs> but when you go to Detroit, and you go to Ohio, and you go to Pennsylvania, and Indiana, and Illinois, where a good share of the automotive industry resides, whole communities have been negatively impacted just by the downturn. It would have been significantly worse and President Bush said a million jobs and $150 billion in tax revenue would have been foregone by the federal and state governments had it been allowed to fail. So, and then there's the infrastructure, the industrial infrastructure of this great nation would have been severely damaged. So I don't care how we got there. The question is, did it work? Well, Chrysler's alive, we're alive. We're not just alive, we're prospering. We're on the globe in this country. Since bankruptcy, we've hired almost 17,000 employees in the United States alone, and we've invested almost $10 billion. And I know against trillion dollar deficits sounds like peanuts. It's not in, in the ability to build new cars. So what are we, we're focused on, you know, what is the evolution of the industry? We want, we can't afford to focus on the near term What's it going to be like in 2030? Why are we spending so much money on alternate uh, forms of propulsion? Whether it be electric, hybrids, ultimately hydrogen fuel cells, which we are a leader on a global basis in hydrogen fuel cells. If I mention names of companies that you all would say, wow, that German company's looking at your technology? It's because this company is a repository of a huge amount of intellectual pro property that's associated with alternative fuels as it evolves. And this country now has an industry that's been totally revitalized that can make the necessary in investments to
to transition our economy to a higher tech and more efficient, cleaner um, industry. One uh, way to separate politics from economics would be to uh, pay back the remaining uh, money that's lent by, our, by the U.S. Treasury. Do you mm -hmm. have a time frame for when that 30% stake, the stock is still below the IPO price. Um, do you have an idea when the Treasury will be paid back the other half? Well, not to parse words, but you say lent. Right, okay. Okay, they nice lent us uh, uh, money. We paid all that back. They provided preferred interest with a uh, preferred stock with a 9% coupon. We've played all that back plus d dividends and interest. And we held the largest IPO in the history of the world. And um, most of that went to the federal government. They own 27% on a fully diluted basis. And they're just like every other shareholder. They, they can sell it when they want. And um, I, I, it is perverse, but I, know, I have some understanding of capital markets. And although we, we produce record profits, why isn't the stock at record levels? Well, part of it is because we have a big shareholder and we don't know when they're going to leave. Because as part of the bankruptcy, we, you've heard the, the uh, structure in the financial world. It was let's take the good assets of the bank and call it good bank and bad bank. Well, we had liquidation motors. And liquidation motors was we left all of the quote unquote toxic assets behind, if you will. Mm -hmm. And there were hundreds of millions of shares that went to, there, there, there was a complicated, I won't draw any conclusions or make judgments about who got a good deal, who didn't. It had to be done quickly. And, and again, there are many paths to the solution, did it work? But we had to give those several hundreds of millions of shares to the liquidated, liquidation motor shareholders. And some of those largely were bondholders. Well, when the stock really swooned late last year is because we dropped a couple hundred million shares on them and they flushed them to the market. So a lot of our big shareholders look at a big holder like the federal government and say, when are they going to exit? And the answer is, candidly, I don't know. And you can understand the hue and cry in Congress, though, if the U.S. government sold shares that are 30 percent th below the IPO price, the scream would be, ah, t tax holders are getting fleeced. They sold at a loss. Bad moves. Well, again, uh, I asked, I won't tell you who I asked the question, is the federal government a private equity firm or were they acting on behalf of we, the people? We are the government. So did our, were our, was our economy, were our, was our citizenship properly served? What if we didn't collect that $150 billion in taxes? Oh, by the way, if we had failed, we had a $23, $24 billion uh, pension shortfall, which I, we've now worked down to around 12 or $13 billion. That would have gone to the PBGC, and the government would have had to take up that $20 billion liability. It's much more complicated than you get in a 20-second blurb on the evening news or a quick uh, sure. uh, thing on, uh, in, in an article. It's this is a complicated bankruptcy on a scale that I think the average citizen in this country doesn't have the interest, quite frankly. So I would say... How would you like them to sell? How would I like them to sell? Well, recognizing this may show up in Washington, uh, <laughs> I think it ought to be a very controlled, I mean, I think a good way to come out and say we own 500 million shares and we sell 50 million shares uh, every quarter for the next 10 quarters. Or uh, something where- Dollar it, cost averaging. Mm -hmm. I, I would just say they're not there to get the last dollar. Um, by the way, there's only, we, when you say, oh, there's only one, automobile company that owns, owes the government any money? That's Ford. Ford we were offered 12 billion. We were, the Michigan delegation was working on our behalf. When I came in, we could apply, and we would, I'm sure we would have been granted 10 to $12 billion of low interest Department of Energy uh, loans for clean and high tech. And I said, we're done with that. And we nixed it. So did Chrysler. Ford has taken, and I, I don't fault them, but I just say the perverseness of it all is their uh, governments help their companies to kind of shape and mold without too much of a heavy hand, shape and mold the direction of um, technology and how the company, how the economy evolves. I don't see anything, uh, it's not a relig religious issue, it's, it's, it's something that's pragmatic and, and, and co co uh, companies are that's done for companies around the globe all the time. 
Another pragmatic issue for a lot of Americans is high gasoline prices. And you yeah. said last year, uh, told CNN that gasoline at about 450 would affect people going into, into showrooms. So how are high gasoline prices affecting car sales and the kinds of cars that Americans are buying? Well, just in my tenure, we've shifted, if you look at the type uh, trucks, crossover, SUVs, sedans, we've seen a shift of almost 12% of our production to small to medium-sized sedans away from large trucks. And that's uh, a function of energy cost and, and us producing better cars in the low end of the market. And I don't mean low end price, but low and smaller cars, more fuel efficient cars. For example, I remember President Obama when I was in private equity in, I think, in an un, unguarded statement of exasperation with the, the whole industry, I guess, and at the depths of the recession said, why can't they build a car like the Corolla? Well, we did. Uh, the best selling uh, compact car in America today is the Cruze, the Chevy Cruze. We, it's not just the Corolla, all of them, in one year. And it makes about 40 miles per gallon. And do you make money on the Cruze? Yes, we do. You, so you can make money, because the general prevailing wisdom is bigger cars, bigger margins. But you can make money on the smaller, medium-sized cars. Yeah, it's, you, you, but you, you, you make a lot more Cruises than you do some other ones. So, uh, we don't want, we're not, you know, we don't make money on the Volt on an incremental, on a one-off basis. But the Volt, so we sold as many Volts in the first year as, as Toyota sold Priuses in their first year. I mean, sometimes you have to be a pioneer to do the right thing and, and kind of shape and mold our own future. And uh, so we'll make investments where we think the long-term future is in our interest. Last year, you said that a dollar a gallon gasoline tax would be preferable to the efficiency standards that were being talked about at that time and, and are subsequently became law in California and the United States. Do you still think that uh, increasing the 18 cent a gallon gasoline tax is a good idea? I think there are a number of approaches to how you want to um, impact consumption. In a fund, there are so many. There are laws, economic laws, just like there are physical laws. And one of them is you don't tax production; you tax consumption if you want to change behavior. And so there are a number of ways to get to that. That was an example, of one of several. Uh, but I do think you can affect. Uh, consumer behavior by a number of different ways. So maybe a gasoline tax increase? I think it ought to be some, it's on a list of p potential alternatives, yes. We put this program on, uh, announced this on Facebook and immediately got a bunch of questions uh, about a particular issue. I'd like to read you one of the questions we got from, from Facebook today. Please ask Mr. Ackerson why GM funds the Heartland Institute, a group that has tried to push misinformation about climate change into our public schools. Is this funding consistent with their company's message and marketing of, of the Chevy Volt? Well, I actually am glad you asked me that. Uh, I wasn't aware of this until the last day or so. Uh, a couple things in terms of good governance. I cannot sit on the foundation's board or steer anything because you're saying it was the General Motors Foundation that gave the money to this institute? Yeah, okay. yeah not the company. Um, let me say another fact. The first time I was interviewed by the press, I was stunned with the following reaction. Some guy says, do you believe in global warming? And I said, well, yeah, I do. Uh, several GM executives said, you don't say that in public. Well, <laughs> this may surprise you. My underwear doesn't have GM stamped on it. And I am an individual, and I do have my own convictions, and it may sometimes they they agree and sometimes they don't. Uh, I think it's actually healthy to have different points of view and perspectives around the table. Um, let's talk about, I always say actions matter more than words. So um, just last week, the EPA named us their star energy provider because of consistent reduction of emissions controls. 60% of our plant, we are 60% more efficient in the use of fuel than we were just five years ago. Landfill usage coming off of our plants is essentially zero. You can put it in a coffee can. That's how we're trying to improve the, we have, we have plant, most of our plants, we have some plants that are completely run off of landfill methane. 
They aren't, there's zero emissions mm. on our, and we have, we have plants that are the size of small farms, two, 300 acres under one roof. Uh, we put $40 million behind the Chevy uh, program with the crews and said we would reduce 8 million metric tons of CO2 in this country in one year, and we've done it. We've, we've, bought, we've bought and paid for forest to be the size of the, city, the state of Connecticut. Uh, this is $15,000 that was committed to before I came in. Um, I also think the Heartland Institute, I'm told, is, does other things, and, and uh, I find this uh, interesting. I won't go any further, but I'll, I'm going to take another look at it when I get back to Detroit. I'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> we've had a lot of conversations here. A lot of companies are thinking about, will there be a price on carbon someday? A lot of markets around the world, in Europe, you're a global company, General Motors. Europe has a price on carbon very low. Australia recently put in a carbon tax. China's moving in that direction. When do you think there'll be a price on carbon and enough and how that will affect uh, your planning for General Motors uh, selling cars around the world? I always like, you know, I'm always, when I was a midshipman Naval Academy, we were told, yes, sir, no, sir, I'll find out, sir. And uh, <laughs> so I, I don't know. I actually think it's an, I, I don't know when that. No one tends. does. There's lots of people have metrics and scenarios. Yeah. All I got to say is, um, I'm a, I'm, I try to be very pragmatic, and we have to allow for all possibilities. And we have significant, we were an active participant and a willing participant in CAFE standards this year. Um, we're going to do our level best to be a corporate, a responsible corporate citizen. And if the wisdom of our political leadership is to put in a carbon tax, we're going to react to it, and we react to it as best we can in the interest of our shareholders. In the past, California is also putting a price on carbon uh, pollution through AB 32, a law that Governor Schwarzenegger passed, uh, signed, and other legislators wrote. Uh, in the past, General Motors spent a lot of time litigating against those sorts of things mm -hmm. and, and, and lawyering, and rather than getting the engineers out there to say, hey, how do we, how do we meet these goals? Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, the yeah. auto industry yeah. signed up for the current round to, to increase mileage standards to 55 miles a gallon. No, 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 we didn't sign up. We actually were parties to it. Okay. And, and we could have, and believe me, there were factions in the company that uh, I, I, this is. The lawyers wanted this, to go at it. This is today's, this is the new GM. And rather than sit in the corner and be obstreperous, we're going to be, we want to be part of the solution. We do not want to be part of the problem. We live in this country. Uh, I have grandchildren and children, and I want them to inherit a better earth than we did. And I think, quite frankly, our generation, it was 1970, the EPA was put into in, in the water and the air in this country is cleaner than it was when I was growing up in the 50s and the 60s, and, and I think it ought to be cleaner next year than it is today. We're not going to get there for free. And, um, and I don't think a huge manufacturer, such as General Motors or any other company, can uh, not be part of the solution, and that's what our goal is to be. And so we were active participants. We weren't dragged to it. And um, Not because the government owns 27% of no. GM, and like you couldn't sue your no. boss, so you had to go along. <laughs> <laughs> what he said. <laughs> <laughs> so CAFE, the mileage standards, were basically flat for 25 years in the United States. Mm -hmm. And from 2010 to 2025, they will go up, uh, they will double from about 28 miles a gallon to 55 miles a gallon. Uh, here in California, there's a law to incre decrease the carbon intensity of liquid transportation fuels mm -hmm. 10%. Mm -hmm. And oil companies, particularly independent refiners, are fighting that tooth and nail in court. I just think it's like your comment on that juxtaposition. Auto in companies increase efficiency 100% and they're at the table voluntarily. The energy companies, oil companies, are fighting 10%. Your response? I'm at a car company. <laughs> I'm not on a, uh, and, and, I, and I, I respect they've got to uh, serve their owners as their owners want them to behave in the marketplace. Um, 
You know, what I'm proud of is in our company, if you look back 25, 30 years, we've taken almost 99% of the pollutants out of the emission of a car. It's still a lot. Uh, I don't know if it's a lot or too much, but it's, we want to be better. So what are we doing? We're producing cars like the Volt. We're producing cars like uh, the BEV, which will be a battery electric vehicle, the Spark, which will be here next year. This week, this week, we came out with a new engine that will burn liquid gasoline, as you see it at Exxon or Chevron or anybody else today, and it also, the same engine, not two engines, the same engine will also burn uh, compressed natural gas. We had to spend a little bit more on lifters, uh, sealants, and, and, and the piston and whatnot, and it'll cost us, I'm not going to give you a number, but it's not pro prohibitive, but it, it allows us to migrate away to a cleaner form of energy over time. So we're not sitting still. We're, we want to be part of the solution, and that comes in many different levels. When we looked at CAFE, for example, you, you probably didn't know this, but if you're Mercedes, as long as you produce 24,999 of a particular model, you weren't subjected to the gas guzzler tax. In other words, if you stayed below 25,000. Well, I don't get that break in Germany. So why in the hell did someone agree to that back in the old days? And, and so I, you know, I, I just said, well, we're at the table, and we're ready to talk Turkey. And I says, but why give it an advantage to a foreign competitor? We're not getting it in Germany. And by the way, guess who didn't show up at the announcement of the new CAFE standards? Which I thought was a mistake. I, I don't think I would have done that. And some of those European companies, when they exceed the rules, they pay a slap on the wrist fine and they go about their merry business, right? Yeah. The, the penalties for noncompliance have been but very we're, low. But we are pushing everything on cleaner energy, more fuel efficient. Uh, we have many cars now that are, having, that are EPA rated at 40 and, 40 and above 42. The new Eco Cruise is at 42. We're coming out with a clean diesel next year for the cruise. Um, mo uh, the the, the uh, uh, collateral impact, positive impact of, our, of all of our work on Volt, we're putting in what we call e-assist on trucks. Mm -hmm. We're putting them on mid-size uh, sedans and small cars. For example, the uh, new next generation, if you really want a good car that'll uh, get good mileage, is the new Malibu that's coming out. I mean, this, this car has just gotten rave reviews, and we put a battery string in the back in a congested city like San Francisco or make any big city in America. We estimate that one in every five minutes you're sitting still or in traffic or a stoplight. Well, you go to, you got your 12-volt battery that'll run your radio and everything else, but we go to a string of lithium-ion batteries in your trunk, and your mileage, mileage will jump anywhere from 25 to 30, 33%. It's, again, and it's cleaner, and you're in the city when you're on that mode. So you're seeing the evolution here, and you can see where it's going over time. Um, and the more creative we are and the greater energy de uh, density that we can get into a ba uh, uh, cell battery, the better off we're going to be. So we already, we we're investing. I mean, this is the new GM. We, we, we put $100 million into GM uh, Ventures. It sounds like a private equity firm, doesn't it? But we decided, look, we, we, don't have, we don't have all the answers. And you have these entrepreneurs, these wonderful entrepreneurs that their life and their soul and their grandmother's inheritance, they invest in everything, everything and, and they live and die with that. Well, I like that intensity. And we get the opportunity to kind of walk around the technology and see if it has an automotive application. So here in California, the Envia, Corporation, I think it was probably picked up in your papers here. It was. They, they, that, that's a very promising technology. We don't know if it's industrialized yet. We have, to, but we we have seeded the money. We should we clarify: it's a company that claims to have made a breakthrough in energy density in car batteries. Yes, lithium ion. So we're excited about that because our battery in the Volt is a 400-pound battery. That's a lot of weight. It gives us 16 kilowatt hours of energy. Well, what happens if it's so dense? It's four times as dense. Well, gee whiz, we got 64. Kilowatts. Well, what's that do? That means the battery can run a lot further. Instead of 40 miles, it'll run maybe 140 miles. And uh, so I believe in my lifetime in technology, there's this ever escalating improvement, and you've got to be optimistic about it that battery technology will improve over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And hearing all that, it sounds like away from petroleum to natural gas, batteries, a mix of fuels. As yes. Opposed to one yeah. And I think the crowning 
you know, the, kind of the holy grail, if you will, will be hydrogen fuel cells. Which we, by the way, we have a fleet of hydrogen. Th this technology works. It's just very, very expensive. The chemistry is extraordinarily complicated, and quite frankly, we're spending, it takes about, a, at first it costs about two ounces of platinum. If you look at platinum prices lately, now we've got it down to a half to a quarter ounce of platinum. But um, that, that when I was with General Instrument, you mentioned we, uh, we were the company that literally invented digital high definition television. The first copy cost us 350 to $400,000. Well, you're buying them now at wherever you're buying your televisions for a couple hundred dollars. Uh, it took a while. But you're going to see cost of uh, hydrogen fuel cells come. Today, we've, got, we've put 3 million miles on hydrogen fuel cell cars today. But the cars cost three to four, $500,000. Now we're down to about three, three fifty, dollars And hopefully in the next 10 years, we'll get it down to maybe thirty-five or forty. Dan Eckerson is chairman and CEO of General Motors. He's our guest today at Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. Uh, the Chevy Volt is the centerpiece of a lot of GM strategy right now. It's brought something of a halo effect to the company, and yet uh, recently the company announced it was suspending production. Mm -hmm. You sold less than you wanted to last year. Mm -hmm. uh, you a little bit disappointed with the Volt, or is this natural for something that's new and uh, a new technology in the marketplace? Well, I, I hope the audience understands what I'm about to say is um, you never have perfect knowledge of what the market's going to do and how well they receive your product. So this cruise I mentioned, the best-selling compact car in America, we closed the plant for two weeks last November. You didn't even know that. No because there's that. so much intensity around the Volt because although it was designed probably when President Obama was in the Senate, it's now his car. He said he's going to buy one. Well, you know, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I wish he'd buy one this year. <laughs> <laughs> but he's not, and uh, not this year, I don't think. But um, it's, it's become somewhat politicized. In fact, the you Volt, always, it's always in the background. And, and so we are going to match production to inventory. And that's what, if you were owners of this business, if it was your company, that's exactly what you would do, whether it's the cruise, whether it's a truck. I mean, we over inventory truck this year. Why? Because we've got to shut our truck lines down for 26 weeks this year because we're doing a whole new remake of our truck line. Well, you know, the average guy on Wall Street says, look at their building inventory. Well, we're going to shut the plant, plants down for 26 weeks this year. So you've got to accept that there's some intelligence behind our decisions. And... Uh, <laughs> The Volt we shut down because we saw inventory building and we want to get it aligned with production and, and demand in the marketplace. We want to show a brief clip of a 15 second ad that uh, is running about the Chevy Volt and I want to ask you about it. So if we could cue that up. For our town. For our country. For our future. This isn't just the car we wanted to build. It's the car America had to build. The extended range electric Chevy Volt. From the heart of Detroit to the health of the country, Chevy runs deep. From the heart of Detroit to the health of the country, why is, why is this good for America? What's the, what are you trying to, what's Jim well, saying? Well, the great thing about the Volt is it represents American innovation, American ingenuity, clean technology, and I think it's um, a statement about what this company represents, the very best that America can produce. It's clean, and it reduces our dependence on oil, especially foreign oil. Okay. Uh, Dan Ackerson is chairman and CEO of General Motors, our guest here today at Climate One. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, last year, Toyota downscaled, reduced downward its profit expectations for the year because of supply chain disruptions in Thailand. Intel did the same thing. Yeah, we um, had it too. You, you had something related to Japan. We had it in Thailand. In too. Thailand. So the floods that struck Thailand are precisely the kind of extreme weather events, droughts, floods, fires, that climate scientists, who I like, heard you earlier, you said you accept their science say will happen with increased intensity and frequency. So my question is, 
you ever run a global business, how do you plan for these kinds of unexpected supply chain disruptions <laughs> that then you know, hit you from the other side of the world? You know, um, we have an operational risk management function within the company. And so when I came in, I said, well, give me the 25 biggest things that, that could happen to you. <clears throat> and um, if you want to lay awake at night worrying about all of it, I did that for a while, then I figured, what the hell am I going to do about that? But I mean, if someone had told me, I mean, it's so tragic what happened in, 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 in Japan, an earthquake, a tsunami, and a nuclear disaster. Um, what it tells you is you have to diversify your supply chain. And um, we are actively doing that. And, uh, you know, it, to be honest with you, depending on how, your, where, how far your supply chain in, went around the globe, some manufacturers were impacted much more so what happened in Thailand than what happened in, right. in, um, in Japan. So um, we, we have taken a hard look at that, as I'm sure all of our competitors have. It's been a lesson learned, and uh, it, uh, I will tell you, we were, we were very concerned in both instances, but we uh, marshaled our resources as best we could. We shut our Shreveport plant down for, I think, four or five days to ensure we had supply to a different set of uh, issues we had, and uh, we were lucky that's all the impact we had for those two natural disasters. So climate risk, uh, climate-driven weather can be a business risk? Oh, yeah. And, and, and in the case of the climate wasn't the issue in Japan, it was just... More Thailand, yeah, right. Th Thailand was uh, probably more likely, I'd like to think it was more likely than what happened in Japan. Uh, you mentioned GM Ventures. Uh, GM Ventures invested in car sharing, I believe, with relay rides. Right. I'd like to talk about yep. you know, the future uh, of car sharing and, and automobiles as a service, mobility yep. as a service, not something that right. people buy and own. Yeah, we're in the mobility business at the end of the day. When you step back at it, and you don't know what shape or form that mobility will take place. We're looking at autonomous cars, too. Do you all know what I mean by autonomous cars? I mean, we're trying to look at everything now. We can't afford to run around with blinders saying we're going to build just trucks. We're going to build every segment of the market, and we're going to try to be the best and most efficient we can in every segment of the market. Well, if it evolves to uh, a zip car type or a peer-to-peer -peer type application that relay cars represent, we want to be part of it. And we have a unique technology in OnStar where we can enable that so mm -hmm. that if you own a car and you want to make it available and you, uh, you can rent it to me for 250 a day, I think it is the running number, they want to take this to all 50 states. So we wanted to be an enabler and of course nothing you do in this world satisfies everybody. I mean I was criticized for being stupid on that one and it was, well, but what if this takes off? What if uh, urban mobility takes that vent? Well, we don't want to be uh, late to the game, so we decided to be proactive rather than reactive, and I think, you know, if it works out, we're going to be, it's always if you're right, you're a genius, and if you're wrong, well, of course we knew you were stupid. Um, but there must be some people inside GM who say, well, wait a minute, that means we'll sell fewer cars. We're in the business of selling cars. If people mm -hmm. rent a car, then yeah. that's bad for our yeah. production, et cetera. So yeah, there, there are people like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. I'm sure they're sitting around saying they're guys like Dan that got us into this thing. But um, that's, you know. Bill you, Ford was here recently. He said, hey, it's going to happen whether we like it or not. We might as well be part of it. We also talked about that some young consumers these days, companies are always interested in young consumers, they might pick their iPhone over their, their, their car as a social yeah. tool for connecting. So you've got to think about that. Yeah. So bringing the, the cloud into the car. Yes, we're very interested in that. These days I've seen advertisements that are more about the entertainment and the console than the car itself. It's mm -hmm. more about the entertainment experience in the car than the, than the car itself. Mm -hmm. It seems like a real interesting approach for a car company to sell the entertainment value of the car. Well, I, I don't know exactly what, you what you're referring to, but we, we under put it under the broad banner of infotainment. Right. And, um, but we don't want to jeopardize the safety on the road, because I, I will tell you, I, I've been going down a road and I see people come over and they say it's as distractive, as it provides as much distraction and risk to oncoming traffic as a, a drunk driver would. Right. Yeah. And, and I have to admit, I'm much more alert to oncoming traffic than I might have been a couple of years ago. 
when I was CEO of Nextel, we talked about short message service, but nobody had the full little keyboard that you get like on the iPhones and, right. and whatnot today. But that being said, we want to have a hands-free, eyes-free application in our cars. That's the thrust we're trying to make. So that if someone texts you, uh, the, f the first phase will be a couple of voice recognitions Did you answer, yes, no, I can't talk right now, I'll call you back. And so let's say your wife or your husband calls you and says, well, while you're downtown, can you pick up the uh, dry cleaning? Yes, no, I'll call you back or whatever. But eventually, uh, we're interested in some of the work that Apple's doing with Siri because you get voice recognition technology, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. going to continually improve. Again, let's get in on the ground floor. We have hired more people from that space than it would probably surprise you the people we're, we're uh, hiring out of Bell Labs, Lucent, these type of industries, so we can be up on that. Uh, the new Q system, Cadillac User Experience, has millions of lines of code written into that infotainment system that will facilitate the introduction into this. But the, the guiding principle is hands-free, eyes-free. So I know it's distractive even to talk, but my wife talks to me all the time when she's driving. <laughs> and uh, we've been married 40 years, and we're still here, both of no us. No crash, good. Um, we are going to put our uh, audience microphone out here and invite your participation, invite you to come uh, with one one-part brief question uh, for Mr. Ackerson. And uh, the line will form back there with our producer, Jane Ann. If you're on this side of the room, we please ask that you go through that door over there uh, rather than crossing these cameras. Uh, yeah, so please, please go through that room and the line will form over there. And while we get that going, our guest today at Climate One is Dan Ackerson, Chairman and CEO of General Motors. Uh, I'm Greg Dalton. We haven't talked about China yet. China is a big part of the auto industry. In fact, there's a Shanghai auto company that owns 1%, I believe, of, of General Motors. No. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the future of China, how big a part it's going to be for General Motors. And will that 1% share, share, could that be increased so there's more cross-ownership with China? Well, um, they bought, to be clear, they bought uh, $500 million, so I'm not sure that equates okay. to 1%. Okay. There, um, we own, uh, we're in a joint venture with Shanghai Auto mm -hmm. in what is now the largest automotive market in the world, and we're, we're proud of that, and we've been gaining market share. And, um, and record sales in China. Yep, just like here. So, uh, uh, but w everything's not great at General Motors. We have our issues. Uh, Europe is a problem for us, South America. We're kind of doubling down in terms of our capital expenditures and whatnot. I mean, this is a, it's a complicated business. But uh, yes, in, in Asia, uh, generally in China and specifically, we're doing well. We have the largest market share. And, um, but we're putting the same press on there. And their government is hand in glove with their uh, manufacturers, just like here, to try and get us to be cleaner, more efficient. And uh, we're working diligently to do it in China as well as we are here. Let's have our first, first audience question, yes. Hi, great conversation. As a founder of a gas roots organization called Don't Be Fueled and host and producer of an environmental radio show, I get a lot of questions about earlier the hybrid car and now the electric car and from a lot of intelligent people. And as you might imagine, I'm a big advocate for cleaner vehicles. Uh, what I'm getting more questions about and not sure how to answer is what about the safety and environmental hazards of these batteries? There's two concerns, EMFs and also disposal of these batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my first question and oh, second. Just one question, we've okay. got a big line, thank you. Um, so the safety of, of uh, the batteries and the recycling. Yeah, the one of the reasons we like, we, we chose the path we went down with batteries, we give an eight year guarantee. And because we cool it with liquid, it's, a, it's called Dexacool, but it's a, not dissimilar to what you'd see in a in an ordinary car, a combustion engine car. But we do that and we never allow the charging to go above 85% or decline below 15%. And that way we can, we can guarantee this battery for eight years. An air-cooled battery, based on our testing to date, is gonna last only two or three years. So A, we're gonna get longer, so it's gonna be in, pro we, we think it'll actually go long, but that's what we're willing to warranty it or guarantee it for. Uh, we've open, we have an open dialogue with some utilities in terms of storing for uh, various applications. 
uh, coming from the cell phone industry, I can tell you, you need to have batteries on all these cell towers because you will lose commercial power at times. So this is a work in progress. I don't have a clear cut, no questions asked, but we are in dialogue with a number of people on how we're going to use these things. And I think the other part of the question was EMS, if that's electromagnetic, uh, there's some concerns around electromagnetic uh, aspects of the batteries? I, I'll be I'm honest not familiar with you, I don't yeah. um, Recycling of the batteries after their useful life? Well, like I say, we're going to try and uh, use them in uh, some sort of application for the storage of electrical energy, and okay. we just haven't sorted all that out yet. Okay. Let's have our next audience question for Dan Ackerson from General Motors. Uh, Mr. Ackerson, uh, Don Sifkus from San Leandro, California. Many consumers would like to be able to buy E100 flex fuel vehicles, not E85, but E100 vehicles whose mileage is optimized for ethanol, not gasoline. What would we have to do to get General Motors to offer these vehicles in the United States? Well, we will build cars or trucks. People say, well, you're building these big cars because that's what the market wants and we're going to meet the market. And that's what you would expect to do. We're a profit-oriented organization. Ethanol isn't in high demand now. And if there was a demand for not 10,000 or 20,000, but 100,000, all of a sudden we'd get more interested in it. And we don't see that demand in the marketplace today. So if the market's there, we'll be there. If the market's not be, there, we're not going to be there. Thank you. Let's have our next audience question for uh, Dan Ackerson. Hi. Um, I was intrigued um, by your statement that fuel cell cars are sort of ultimately where you want to be. I'm curious why you think that's um, the final goal for technology development. Well, uh, uh, let me say there's a practical application to that. We need the infrastructure. We need a distribution system for not only natural gas, but for hydrogen. But why am I intrigued with it? because literally you can take a two-month-old baby and put a baby underneath that exhaust just as long as the drip, dripping water doesn't impact on the child's ability to breathe. You're, you're in as good a shape sitting where you are as that child is. And I think um, at, at the turn of the century, there were six billion people on this planet. By mid-century, there's going to be nine billion, nine billion people. And we're going to really have to be... Uh, good stewards of our environment. And I think ultimately you want zero emissions. Well, one of the challenges for hydrogen is where does the hydrogen come from? How much energy does it take to create that hydrogen? Yeah. You know where most of the hydrogen is produced today? Refineries. And th I'm sure they, the oil companies would be very happy to get some revenue for that, but there's transportation and infrastructure issues. Yeah, they, they don't them. use it, largely don't use it right. today. Be so great. why don't they just so in the you? pipeline yeah. somewhere. Well, um, you know, they, they can, that's their business. I, right. I, I, we're not going to get into that business. We're not that smart. That's a, that's a tough business. But Governor Schwarzenegger has tried a lot of, uh, pushed hard on hydrogen. It hasn't really taken off in California. Yeah, I, I, you know, leadership's a tough thing. Sometimes you've got to make tough decisions, and sometimes you're going to be wrong. Of course, everybody's going to remember when you're wrong and not when you're right. But... Um, at some point in time, um, this is, I think, the future. And um, it may not materialize. The market may not be there. If it's not, that's why Volt and, high, uh, you know, the first, this is the first chapter written in a book called Alternative Forms of Propulsion or Alternative Propulsion. And it will evolve over time. The chapters are yet to be written. And maybe I'm wrong. I always have to allow for that possibility, as my wife tells me, I have been wrong. And uh, if it isn't hydrogen, well, then we better figure out a way uh, to, to produce a lot of electricity. Let's face it, electricity produced at a coal-fired plant doesn't have emission, uh, pure emissions either. And um, there are strong points of view around all that, whether it be natural gas or nuclear or coal. But at the end of the day, uh, modern societies, competitive society, societies have to figure out how to get the cleanest, most efficient form of energy to the marketplace. And, um, and I think as uh, the world evolves and energy evolves, you'll see, um, you may see this evolve into hydrogen fuel cells. 
Let's have our next question for Dan Ackerson and Climate One. Uh, Dan, my name is John Thomas. I'm from the Mad Hedge Fund Trader. I have a personal question for you. When you were offered the post of running GM, what initially came to your mind? Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? What was it in this job that lured you to accept that offer, and who specifically made that offer? Well, um, I think GM is the most, one of the most complex, most interesting, and most challenging business opportunities of my generation of management. And where I was in private equity and thought, well, I would just finish my career there, it was, it was genuinely intriguing. And, and I thought I could make a difference. Um, I'd been overseas for two weeks, came to the board meeting, and... Uh, we should clarify, you were on the GM board first, and then you yeah, became... Yeah, I was at a board meeting. I was part of the new board that was brought on post-bankruptcy. And then the uh, CEO said, well, he was leaving. He was 68, going to be 69. And he'd he, he, he was a temp uh, interim because we'd lost our CEO from the old uh, GM, the, the prior management. And uh, candidly, I went on, uh, I'd had this vacation, and, uh, s and uh, my daughter uh, was pregnant, so she couldn't go anywhere, so we took her uh, and my other granddaughter. And I almost turned the job down, because when we, my wife and I kind of wanted a couple of days to think about it, and, when I told my granddaughter I wasn't going to be around so much, you know, she started crying. And, but I'd already accepted by then, and I figured my man's as good as his word. So I, but I'm glad I did it. And it's, it's uh, I mean, there are some personal aspects of it that aren't all that attractive. Um, but, you know, uh, I'll be back in the home range with my granddaughter in some period here in the future. And uh, that will settle that concern. But, Hi, Dan. Uh, you touched very briefly on business conditions in Europe that you're seeing right now. Yes. And I think there's way too much capacity over there. Uh, yes. And I wonder what we're doing uh, to uh, address that. Are you going to be closing some plants there? And why are, uh, could you quantify how much money we are, we're actually losing in Europe at the moment? Well, what's going on in Europe is not dissimilar to what happened in the United States prior to the Great Recession. And to give you an idea, we shut 14 plants in this country because the average plant utilization in the United States prior to the recession was at about 70%. So we overproduced to cover our fixed cost. And then we tried, and, and this is the unnatural act that was being perpetrated, we tried to bend the, the supply and demand curve. So we overproduced to cover these fixed costs because we weren't efficient and thereby these too many, we supplied too much versus demand and we would dump those cars into rental fleets, either corporate or rental. And um, what did that do? It diminished the, the resale price because we had to sell those cars at a lower price. So the residual and the cost of ownership over three to five years and we destroyed a, a channel of distribution called leasing and it was People were overproducing to hold share, and so prices were coming down generally, and it was just kind of a, like a whirlpool. That's ex and, and so we shut down 14 plants, 14 plants. The disruption and dislocation was pretty uh, significant. In Europe today, uh, we shut a plant down when we restructured post-parent bankruptcy and we were profitable. When we, were on the, when we were on a road trip, we were losing about a billion dollars, including restructuring costs. And I made the bold statement, I thought we could get us back to profitability. We were actually profitable by about 300 odd million in the first half of 11. And then we lost about that much in the third quarter because when we were going through our crisis last year, when we got downgraded as, as our national debt was, rating was downgraded and there was a, a lot of controversy in Washington where we were going to lift the debt ceiling or was the country going to default? Well, think about we finally got that sorted out. But in Europe, they're hearing about potential sovereign debt uh, defaults twice a day, every morning when they get up before they go to bed. And it hurt to their customer, their um, their consumer confidence, people stop buying, we can see it, I can tell you, I see it every day in our sales reports. And um, so, same thing's happening. 
everybody's they're idle they're 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 doing what we call short weeks where they send them home and there are certain benefit packages so we we still have those plants open and so it's estimated there may be as many as seven to ten plants excess across the entire industry you take it from Volkswagen, Mercedes, BMW, Peugeot, Fiat, Renault, Opel, all of them. And we have to kind of right size our operations in order to, uh, to uh, gain, uh, achieve profitability again. This last year, last year, including a write down of goodwill, which is an on cash charge, and restructuring for another 200 million, we lost about 700 million, a little over 700 million dollars in Europe. It is a uh, very troubling situation. We've already um, taken action to uh, address that. But I think it'll be a good uh, maybe year or two before we can achieve profitability in Europe again. Um, we're not giving up on it. And uh, we're in dialogue, discussions with our various constituencies, our dealers, our unions, our management to uh, affect a, a solution that's uh, satisfactory and optimizes the uh, outcome for us. We're discussing the auto industry with Dan Ackerson, Chairman and CEO of General Motors. I'm Greg Dalton. We have a few minutes left for a few questions. So yes, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Shovik Banerjee. I work at Solar City. We're the uh, nation's largest residential solar installer. And about 20 months ago, we launched our uh, electric vehicle charging division, and it's been growing quickly. And we see a lot of customers think about their, uh, the energy powering their home is tied to the energy that powers their vehicle in a way that, that didn't really exist before. Uh, the Volt ties you to your customers' homes in a way that you really weren't before. So how, how does this affect your company's strategy and, and what challenges and opportunities does it present to be so much more tied to your customer's home? Well, we actually invented, uh, not invented, we, we invested in a company that they build a little kind of, um, I want, I'll say lean to it, it's not really it, but you drive in and it's all got solar panels above it and you drive in there and you just plug the car in and you're home free. Uh, could that happen? Uh, carport, yeah. Yeah, carport, I'm sorry. That's a good technical term, I like that. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, is that a solution? We do a lot of inductive, you know, like with your cell phone, you can put it on a pad. We, invented, we invested in a company like that. You'll see that in, in, in our models coming out. So you take your cell phone, you throw it in there, and you don't have to plug it in and worry about the jack and all this other stuff. Convenience. You'll see that in our cars in the upcoming years. Well, then someone said, well, why don't we just get one the size of, uh, put it on your garage floor, and you just drive on that. Of course, then, then you think of old Fido walking across there. And, I mean, you, you got to worry about all this stuff. So, yeah, we're thinking about everything because... It, it, for example, if, if natural gas is the solution, and you, I have natural gas in my home, why not just fuel your car at home? Well, I can tell you that, that wouldn't go down well with Exxon and, and the boys because all of a sudden they got another form of distribution. But we're thinking like that because I, you know, what's one company's solution is another's bad news. But there, there, there may be alternate f plans for distribution in the, ne in the coming decades. I don't know, but I can tell you, you'd have to, uh, to get the pressure, to pressurize natural gas from uh, a residential feed into a car, you'd have to pick the pressure up to get it in there. And so there are a lot of practical problems that need to be solved or addressed, but we're looking at everything and everything's on the table. Whether it's relay cars, we'll look at anything that people say, well, why would GM do that? Well, I think Bill Ford's right. It's going to happen whether, you know, we can't control the universe. We're a company. We have to be, we have to react to reality. We want to predict the future so we can be proactive. So I don't know if it's going to be electric and in, in, in infused into a, the architecture of a home or if it's going to be um, natural gas. I don't think anybody's going to be putting nuclear reactors on cars anytime soon. But, I mean, if they did, we'd start thinking about it. Do you have a charging a volt charging station in your garage? Yes, I do, and uh, I love it. And, and I, I'll tell you, I've now driven probably. I, I had one of the first volts in what we call a captured test fleet. I drove it for 2,500 miles. I put eight tenths of a gallon of gas into it. We talked to 40 plus uh, volt dealer uh, owners today, 
And there was one fellow who uh, had driven it, he's had it 12 months, drove it, driven it 13,000 miles, and he still has the initial gas that he got when he bought the car. So uh, and on, on your Volt, it tells you how much you've gotten. I mean, with the Volt I bought a, about a month ago, I've now used a tenth of a gallon of gas. And uh, so, you know, you're averaging 190 to 100 miles equivalent on these cars, and I think that's, uh, that's good news. And if we can get this battery density up, instead of going 40 miles, you'll maybe go 240 miles. And that, but the thing that's great about the electric range vehicle, I mean, it's just this huge step forward in innovation and creativity and, and ingenuity. But also, you can drive that car from here to Florida and back. It is not an urban car. It's a car with all those wonderful adjectives and a high degree of utility. You don't have to restrict your thinking. You don't have to have range anxiety. Let's have our last audience question. You drop a purple pill in that thing and it'll work really well. <laughs> uh, Mr. Ackerson, I'm a Vietnam Air veteran and I understand you were a naval officer that served off the coast of Vietnam. I was wondering if you could say a few words for the naval sailors that are serving off the coast of Iran and what would happen if they engage in military conflict there and gasoline prices rising. How can GM rally this nation to adjust to those much higher gasoline prices? Well, thank you for your service. Uh, I was in the Navy for five years. I did not serve in Vietnam. I was in the Sixth Fleet, which was in Europe. Uh, we faced off against than the Soviet Union. Um, you know, I, I think that's beyond my pay grade. I, I have, I have uh, unlike a lot of people in this country today, uh, I believe in our political leadership, that they'll come to the right decision. And um, I, I actually think it's a benefit to have served in the military, because I think those are the folks that are last to want to go to war. Um, and I would, I would think seriously, deeply and hard about committing our young men and women to combat, and whether it's Iran or Vietnam or Iraq. And um, that's a citizen's thing. I don't want to speak as a, I, I want to restrict my commentary to my role as the CEO of uh, General Motors. And, but I, uh, I hold these young men and women in the highest regard uh, it breaks your heart when you hear that, uh, well, they, they give so much to us. And we're a big sponsor of everything to do with uh, veterans. We have 3,000 veterans, and we made a choice if someone goes, like when I, back in the day, as they say, I say to my children, when, we, when one of our uh, employees goes away, we still pay them at the same. If they get paid, if they were getting paid three thousand dollars a month, and they go to pick a number, thousand, we'll make up the two thousand. The benefits continue. We want them to feel like their families are protected, and um, we, uh, we, in conjunction with the UAW, we give to wounded warriors. I personally am very involved with Veterans Affairs. Uh, we have a veterans affinity group within the company that's very active. Uh, they do food baskets and send stuff. We're very active in cell phones for soldiers uh, everywhere in the country, and uh, we support um, um, the wounded. In fact, if you saw the Army-Navy game, every Army-Navy game we go to, which I happen to go to all the time, uh, it's very important that we meet with these wounded uh, veterans. So, but I. I share your concern and um, pray for peace. We'll have to end it there. Our thanks to Dan Ackerson, Chairman and CEO of General Motors, for his comments here today on Climate Run. I'm Greg Dalton. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Mr. Ackerson. <laughs>